Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 103. This week's questions are taken from guide 171 on the De Seven Provencian, the cruiser, and the Battle of Coronel Wednesday video. So let's get on with question time. Erdania uh, Gillard asks, how practical do you think it is to have up-armoured barbettes and turrets versus having a bit more armour on the rest of the ship? Not to throw shade on my forefathers, but it seems like having bigger holes in your ship's hull is more detrimental to your survival than having them in your guns when you're a lone ship like the De Seven Provencian. So when you're forced to make this kind of decision, to be perfectly honest, I actually think that it was the correct choice to up-armour the barbettes and turrets, especially for the period it was built in, because when you're in the kind of fight that is involved with people slinging shells at you, a shell penetrating your belt and knocking a hole in the side of a ship, yes, it will can lead to flooding if your belt is insufficiently armoured, and yes, at worst, it could knock out some or all of your engines, which would leave you without power. However, in both of those cases, it's going to take some time for your ship to go down and you have time for damage control to make good. Whereas the barbettes, they protect your ammunition feed um, and then your turrets obviously protecting the gun, the main way you strike back as well as the ammunition stored there. And depending on exactly how you've designed the ship and its barbettes, it may also be protecting some of the upper parts of the magazine itself. Bearing in mind the magazine and shell room are two separate levels usually. So if a shell gets in there, at best, you lose a good portion of your ability to fight back, at which point the rest of you is going to get holes knocked in you sooner or later. At worst, it's going to set off an ammunition explosion and then, well, you can't really damage control a magazine going off. So especially, well, you can with a cruiser or something of that scale, but when you're talking about something that's mounting capital ship grade firepower, there tends to be a lot of explosive on board. So, yeah, you can get back home with holes in the side of your ship. You can't get back home when a magazine detonation's torn the bow or stern off of your vessel. So, I mean, it's not an ideal scenario at all where you have to choose between armouring your belt or your um, barbettes and turrets. But if you have to make that choice, I would say that if you're going to be fighting a cruiser grade action with maybe six inch guns or something in that vicinity then yeah you probably want to stick a little bit more on your belt because it doesn't take too much belt armor to be able to resist six inch fire over a fairly wide distance and over a fairly large area whereas if you're going into a fight with something a bit heavier then you really 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 don't want your magazines and barbettes cooking off at any time deplorable miko terra asks what would have needed to happen for the Dutch to remain a major naval player, say around the size of France, into the 20th century? And might such a navy deter a German invasion in the Second World War, as they might not want such a fleet to sail to join the Royal Navy? It depends how far back you want to go. I mean, if you want to properly fix the problem, then you have to go pretty much to the start of the 18th century. Um, so 1700, 1710 period and do something to address the decline of the Dutch Republic <laughs> because ultimately that ends up with a short period of occupation by France and then you have to rebuild the Dutch Navy from scratch because everything that the British didn't take at the Battle of Camperdown the French do take when they occupy in 1810. If you want to be after that point as your point of departure then it's basically going to come down to a combination of luck and aggression. Luck in that one of the smallest butterflies you could put in would be just that the, maybe the Dutch order the battleships they were going to be ordering in the 1910s just that little bit earlier um, so that they actually have a battleship squadron available. Now the possibly the best way of doing that and although it would smart quite badly in terms of uh, Dutch shipyards and stuff, but possibly the best way of doing that would be to contract out to the British if they'd asked for something, let's say something along the lines of the Queen Elizabeth class. And I say that purely because of the timing of the build. If the Dutch bought, say, three Queen Elizabeth class derivatives in 
1911, 1912-ish, and they start construction, then that means they're going to all of them be in a fairly advanced state of construction by the beginning of World War One. Now, yes, that does mean that the British are almost certainly going to um, purchase them or uh, quote-unquote acquire them for the duration of the war, much as they did with Erin, Agincourt and Canada. But being as they are pretty powerful units, they're unlikely to end up um, particularly heavily battered or lost. They're also going to be, relatively speaking, still with a fair number of miles on the clock once they finish, and they're still going to be relevant, which then means that much how uh, much as how the British then returned Almirante La Torre to the Chilean Navy, then the Dutch would be able to probably negotiate a discounted rate for the return of their now slightly used battleships, which would actually end up as an overall good economy measure for them. Now, ironically, that wouldn't put you at the same numbers of dreadnoughts as France, because they'd have the Corbets and Britannias. However, it would put you, the Dutch Navy actually pr probably, all things considered, as equally as powerful, if not more powerful, than France in terms of... Uh, actual battle line use so i mean that doesn't increase the cruiser and destroyer fleet size to the kind that would be relevant but the whole naval redevelopment program that the netherlands had planned would probably have to be advanced a couple of years as well i mean again similarly because anything that's built by germany in the first world war obviously you're not going to get your hands on um before or after France has its own problems so it's going to be a case of probably yeah contract out the battleships to the UK and focus in maybe 1912 13 14 building up a squadron of decent decently powerful cruisers maybe even go after some uh, some of the ones that were being sold off towards the end of World War one that would give you a relatively powerful fleet and then obviously they're going to spend most of their time safeguarding dutch interests in the dutch east indies so that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is as i say simply to be more aggressive so that the luck part is 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 that and aggression would come down to the 19th century colonial period because when you look at the other powers, obviously Britain made an absolute fortune off of that period um, and the Industrial Revolution. France has a big economy anyway because it's France, it's quite large. Germany, towards the latter part of the 19th century, once they became unified equally, has large population base, large industrial base, large country size for, for, as far as European countries are concerned, so they could get pretty big as well. The Netherlands is in this circumstance where it's physically too small to have a a homegrown economic powerhouse of the kind that France and Germany have. So it's going to have to go a more colonial style um, enterprise and expand more aggressively, try and grab additional colonies, because let's face it, the ones it's lost in the East Indies are probably not going to get back. Maybe promote the use and sale and luck out on the discovery of oil in their overseas possessions sooner that'll give them a nice financial lifeline and yeah if they've got a slightly bigger empire and if they manage to target some of the more resource rich areas shall we say then they would have more money to pay for a larger navy um, but either way would that this theoretically larger navy going into the second world war deter the germans um to be honest, I don't think so. I mean, the, the Dutch Navy, whilst it definitely wasn't on a the level of the French, it was still a relatively considerable force. But most of it was in the Dutch East Indies, and that probably isn't going to change. And as far as the Germans were concerned, out of sight, out of mind, and they, they probably had a, something of an inkling that the Japanese would be a bit more of a concern for the Dutch at that point anyway. So, yeah. I mean, we look at the Polish Navy, the the Germans' main response to that was to try and bomb it all in port. And when you look at the French Navy, which is what the Germans were building up their navy to actually fight, the French Navy, even with Dunkirk and Strasbourg, etc., didn't deter the Germans from uh, rampaging into France. 
perhaps if those battleships had been built and if there had been a squadron of cruisers to accompany them, really you need to look at political change earlier in the 1930s, building up the Dutch military in concert with having that larger navy. Because the navy itself, is, as I say, isn't going to deter the Germans. But if the Dutch Air Force, the Dutch Army, the Dutch fortifications are also invested into a similar tune, that in turn might then make the Netherlands look like too much of a hard nut to crack for the Germans, and they might be persuaded to go elsewhere. And, well, even if they do uh, head in and still try and take over the Netherlands anyway, uh, it'll be a lot tougher for them, and the the threat of large portions of the Dutch armed forces, especially pilots and ships being able to head over to the UK to continue the fight, might factor into their, their strategic calculations a bit more at that point. Commodore Squid asks, do you think the Kaiser-class dreadnoughts of the German Navy were good, i.e. do they make up for having lower calibre guns? What are the pros and cons of an echelon turrets, and was there a ship that made good use of them? Well, if you look at the basic three characteristics of speed, protection, and firepower, speed-wise, perfectly fine. Protection-wise, they're definitely at the upper end of the spectrum for that period, and almost 14 inches of belt armour. Armament-wise, and this connects to what you referred to in the second part of your question about an echelon turrets, no. I, I don't think they were particularly brilliant. So overall, they're kind of, they've got a negative for uh, firepower, they've got a positive for armour and a overall average for speed. So at best, I would say they're middling, maybe towards the lower end because of specifics about the N echelon turret. So let's have a look at that particular bit. The thing is, with the N echelon turrets, there's only two real reasons for having them one of which is that you think you need a lot of end on fire and that presumes that the target is probably going to be running away and the other one is that your machinery space and boiler space is taking up far too much room amidships both uh, lengthwise and vertically which means that you can't afford to put the turrets on the center line now there's also an ancillary reason which is that you might want multiple turrets multiple heavy turrets but you might not want to have super firing turrets but that's more of a British thing than a German thing to be perfectly honest. So let's examine the two main ones. Well if you've got N echelon turrets for end on fire with a limited amount of cross deck firing with the best will in the world even Admiral Fisher who is the biggest proponent of end on fire I think is still wrong about that because there's one major factor. If you've got wing turrets their ability to fire sort of against their side, so if your port turret, its ability to fire slightly to starboard, is going to be very heavily limited by the forward turret or turrets and your superstructure. And that means that if you've got these wing turrets, the only real scenario where you're going to get end on fire is where you're pointed perfectly at your enemy or realist, more realistically pointed in the direction that they're going. That's a very, very narrow angle to be firing at, and it only really will hold as long as your enemy is running away from you. If they're not, um, or if they're changing course or direction at any given point, those wing turrets aren't going to avail you too much because the enemy will be off at a bearing such that you can only use one or the other of them anyway. So they kind of fail on that ground, to be perfectly honest, practically speaking. As far as the machinery argument goes, that's valid for the Nassaus, to maybe a certain degree the Helgelands. But by the time you get to the Kaisers, when you look at their plan in profile, yeah, the machinery spaces and the boiler rooms go basically right up to the aft super firing turret and right up to the four single twin turret. But... In the middle of the ship, you've got two sets of barbettes, two sets of magazines, two sets of shell rooms, two sets of everything because you have these two cross-deck turrets. So you're having to take up that space anyway. If you put a single turret amidships, a sort of a Q turret style arrangement, as was being done at the time in the contemporary sort of Orion King George V class, you would have a much more effective broadside because the... The Kaisers have 10 12-inch guns, and yes, they do have a certain degree of cross-deck firing, and yes, it's probably slightly better angles than uh, 
uh, British attempts at cross-deck firing, but it's still very limited angles. If you're sailing at anything other than broadside to broadside, you're down to an eight-gun broadside, and to be perfectly honest, at the point that you're building either second-generation dreadnoughts or what should be maybe your um, first-generation super dreadnoughts, an eight-gun salvo with 12-inch guns is not really acceptable. And before anybody goes on about, oh, German 11-inch guns were equivalent to British 12s, the German 12s were equivalent to British 13.5s and so on, no, no, they weren't. Um, it, it's a complete nonsense. I don't know where it's come from on the internet, but it is a complete and utter nonsense. There's some argument to be made around precise penetration characteristics for the last generation of German 11-inch guns versus the notably problematic 12-inch 50 caliber guns that were used on the last generation of British 12-inch gun ships, but a comparison of the German 12-inch versus the British 13.5-inch, it's no comparison at all. The 13.5-inch carries more explosive power, assuming the shells are built properly, and it can range out further, albeit fair enough, some of that is down to turret elevations on the relative ships, but more importantly, the armour penetration on the 13.5 is considerably more. A lot of people get misled by looking up basic charts and going, ah oh, yes, well, the, the German 12-inch gun has superior penetration, failing to note that immediately underneath most of those charts is the point that the most of the extant tables that are used for British guns at the time 13.5 and such like are for AP shells without their caps. Put the caps back on, the performance goes way up, there's a certain known metric for that, and all of a sudden it is more like what you would expect. So yeah, eight 12 inch guns, it's just not. No. Point me at the Koenigs who solved that problem, and yeah, then, then we're talking. The Koenig class, in my view, definitely gets it right. They move effectively have the same number of turrets but they move one of them to a super firing position forward and put the other one in this kind of q turret position in british parlance amidships which now actually gives you a lot more firepower because not only do you ha now have a 10 gun broadside but that 10 gun broadside is able to exert itself across a fairly wide arc of fire and it still retains the good quality armor protection it still retains the decent speed so yeah the, the Koenigs correct almost all the flaws that are present in the Kaisers and to be perfectly frank the Koenigs are probably one of the best 12 inch gun dreadnoughts that were built the Wyoming class fans and the Koenig class fans can fight it out in the comments over who gets top spot Sergeant Spiffy Wiffy asks, I have a vague memory about radar guided anti aircraft guns in World War II in one of your videos about how the US had many, many AA guns that put up a wall of flak and force enemy planes to keep their distance, only to be sniped out of the sky by British guns. If I'm not just making this up, when did radar become good enough to aim guns at planes, and who had the better technology or tactics? So, yes, this is something I've covered before, but just to sort of recap and clarify, what the issue was. Uh, was that at the end of World War II, towards the end of World War II, I should say, the Japanese had obviously mostly been fighting the Americans, and the heaviest dedicated anti-aircraft weapon that the US had was the 5-inch 38. There were some other slightly heavier AA guns that could be used, or weapons that could be used in an AA role, but the 5-inch 38 was kind of the main heavy anti-aircraft gun. And being a 38 caliber weapon there were certain limitations on its range. Now, by towards the end of the war, the Japanese had pretty much learned how far away from the US ships do you have to be to not be hit by a 5-inch 38 shell because it can't physically get you at a certain altitude. So they knew this, and they knew to circle just beyond that until it was time to go in and, well, and just hope that uh, their ancestors were watching over them and that there wasn't a Hellcat with their name on it coming out of the clouds, but that's a completely separate matter. What then happened was when you sort of get around to the Okinawa campaign and periods around that point is the British show up, 
And the British, as can be seen here, are equipped with their heaviest dedicated anti-aircraft weapon as the 5.25 inch gun. Now it's only marginally larger in, in calibre, but it's a much longer barreled weapon, which means it has a significantly longer range and can reach significantly higher than the 5 inch 38. Both parties, the US Navy and the Royal Navy, had radar directed anti-aircraft fire controlled by this point. However, the Japanese were staying outside the range of the 5 inch 38, which turned out to be not outside the range of the 5.25 because of its longer barrel and its higher velocity. And so the Japanese aircraft would be circling or patrolling in relatively static patterns because they weren't expecting to be engaged, mainly looking out for the aforementioned combat air patrols. And then all of a sudden radar guided high velocity anti-aircraft shells from the 5.25s would start picking them out of the sky, which was a big surprise to them and a perfectly welcome transition from threat to fireball for the Allied navies. Now, as I said, both sides had the both the sides, both nations, the US Navy and the Royal Navy, had their their radar guided fire control. And at this point, to be perfectly honest, in terms of better technology and tactics, it was pretty much a wash. The US Navy um, had been the progenitors and distributors of the Mark 37 fire control system. The Royal Navy had adopted that system on a, quite a number of its ships and had massively updated the high angle control system into its latest variant on others. Both, si both navies had um, good radars of varying descriptions and capabilities, but they both both had radar capable of handling anti-aircraft fire control. Both were using the 40mm Bofors and to the end, towards the end of the war, to a lesser extent, the 20mm Orlikan. So, yeah. <laughs> Who ha and both sides were actually deploying absurd amounts of these light and medium AA weapons. So technology was pretty much a wash at that point. Tactics-wise, it's... Um, it's a bit of both, really. The, the US Navy had had most of its anti-aircraft experience come through the Pacific War, when they were obviously fighting the Japanese. The Royal Navy had most of its anti-aircraft experience come through fighting the Germans and Italians in the European theatre. And so their specific anti-aircraft tactics worked very well against their chosen opponents, or well, the opponents they ended up having to fight. But there were weaknesses of both sides approaches when you switched targets um the a kind of a, a barrage for example that might well put off a slightly more survival oriented italian or german strike wing tended not to discourage the japanese pilots much if at all uh, conversely the pump the sky full of shot approach that the us navy took is even with the radar directed um systems the germans well, the italians to be honest dropped out of the war a bit too early for massive tactic adaptation to that but the germans certainly during especially during the italian campaign kind of retaliated against that by investing in more standoff weaponry that could um drop drop it in attacks from beyond the range, effective range of the anti-aircraft fires, things like Fritz X and the HS2 whatever number it is missile. Where So in those circumstances, the possibly slower firing, well certainly slow firing, but slightly longer ranged approach of the Royal Navy made a little bit more sense. So it, 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 it varied really but I, I certainly wouldn't want to go up against either the Royal Navy or the US Navy's anti-aircraft defences towards the end of the war so hopefully that's a bit of clarification Master of Dickery asks could HMS Canopus have made a meaningful difference to the Battle of Coronel or would Spey have just declined combat if we're assuming that Canopus's engineer isn't in the middle of a full on mental breakdown and the ship's actually able to get up to 17-ish knots it's not going to hold back Craddock's squadron all that much, certainly not any more than Otranto is, so they're probably going to get into roughly the same position at roughly the same time. At that point, well, Von Spee's opinion is known, but if we look at it from a purely objective standpoint, to be honest, I think I kind of agree with Von Spee. 
it would be a very bad move to try and engage a squadron that includes a pre-dreadnought battleship. Now, fair enough, the Shan Horse class armored cruisers are pretty darn powerful. Um, but even though Canopus is not the world's best protected of pre-dreadnoughts, it's still protected enough to give it a decent amount of security against incoming 8.2-inch shells at most of the reasonable ranges, and that gives it plenty of time to engage its own 12-inch guns in, obviously, counterfire, as well as, obviously, the secondary battery. And it's only going to take one or two hits to... Well, it's going to only take one or two hits in the right places to, to do some real damage to the Shan Horse, but even beyond that, against any of the targets, Von Spee can't afford a lot of damage for his ships. Um, anything beyond the superficial and the cosmetic is going to severely imperil their ability to progress and probably make them a severe hamper on the rest of the squadron. Given that Von Spee pressed in for a relatively speaking close action at night, now the gunnery part that Von Spee pressed for, that still is going to be to his advantage. But when you look at how close the two British armoured cruisers got, even considering how obsolete they were and how vulnerable they were to the much more modern German units, and considering how much t tougher of a target Canopus is, if Canopus is charging in there along with them, Von Spee has an absolute devil's choice because he can either focus fire on the British armoured cruisers, which are more numerous and slightly faster, and that'll probably have about the same effect as it did historically, except now you have a pre-dreadnought battleship at melee range, which is not a good thing. Or you can try and focus all your fire on Canopus, and okay, fair enough, both Shan Horse combining their fire will probably do a fair number to Canopus. It's, it can, Canopus will still be able to fire its main battery, but it might lose its secondary battery, get holes in its funnels, etc., pretty quickly. But it's going to take a lot more working over than Monmouth or Good Hope did to get it um, to, to a state where it's completely combat ineffective. And during all that time, Monmouth and Good Hope are going to be closing the range, at which point their guns and torpedoes will come into play. And again, not brilliant news, because if they're not being fired on by the Scharnhorsts, then, um, well, it's almost practice fire conditions. I mean, there are the smaller cruisers, but the smaller cruisers probably aren't going to want to be anywhere near this particular fight. So, yeah, it probably would make a, a fair, fairly significant difference if the action was chosen. Von Spade would have the opportunity to decline combat because he does have the faster squadron. The main problem is that with Craddock's squadron in a blocking position... What else can Von Spee do if, if at the point that he's met up with Craddock's squadron, he heads back into harbour, Craddock will just blockade him until additional forces show up, and ironically enough, you're pretty much in the situation that the ship uh, Admiral Graf Spee would end up in in the Second World War. Or Von Spee can run out into the Pacific, but there's not really anywhere to go, because at the other side of the Pacific is HMAS Australia, and the Congos, or at least half of them. And while he is faster, he's not fast enough to do a complete sort of sweep around the British squadron because they can fall back in a straight line. And with a two to three knot difference, that massive arc he'd have to do to get around their position, he just wind up arcing back in front of them again as they fall back. So, yeah. Canopus would have made a huge change, and um, it's difficult to tell what, if anything, Von Spee could have pulled off other than possibly heading north and trying to outrun them that way, maybe head off towards Central America and try something from there. Jerko J asks, While reading the 1940 edition of Jane's Fighting Ships, I've noticed that the Italian battleships Conte de Cavour, Giulio Cesare, Dulio, and Andrea Doria are all listed as belonging to the same class, whereas on Wikipedia and other online resources, the first two are of a separate class from the latter two. Which is right, were these ships considered part of the same class when launched, and have refits made them similar enough to be grouped into a single class? So they are separate classes, they're definitely separate classes at launch, albeit that the Conte de Cavours were, their design was adopted with only a very few changes into the Andrea Doria. So 
they're generally of a similar size, they have a similar main armament, they have similar armor protection, with the exception of the uh, deck armor, where the Androidorias are a bit better off. They have generally similar speed. The main difference at, at a glance when you're looking at the two is that the Androidorias have 6-inch guns as opposed to 4.7-inch guns on the Cavors for their secondary battery. There's a few minor visual reference changes as well, but nothing fantastic in terms of their capacity as a fighting unit. Now, okay, when they've been modernized and refitted, they are a lot closer together in terms of, again, armament, speed, etc. But there are still differences. So broadly speaking, I would say that Jane's 1940 is slightly wrong in that respect. Um, they're, they're not directly comparable. Now, the only thing I would say is that at the time of publication, Andrea Doria and Caio Dulio were still both in dry dock being modernised. Admittedly, it was towards the end, but it's wartime and the Italians aren't going to be exactly forthcoming about the precise nature of the refits. So given how similar they were before the refits and that the, the latitude was still in refit, you can probably reasonably interpolate, if you're the Jane's editor at that point, that they might come out with the same kind of refit as the immediately preceding vessels. But that's that's a guess. So it's a reasonable mistake to make, but it is still a mistake um, in in making that assumption. And to be, if you're going to be completely brutal, given that Warspite's refit was not the same as Queen Elizabeth's and Valiant's, and they were of the same class, you, you probably don't want to necessarily count on um, the Italians refitting for ships from two distinct classes, even if they are subtly different in precisely the same way. Richard Mayeroff asks, how would you design later monitors of the Civil War Union Navy to make them more effective Blue Navy ships, given the capabilities of the Union's infrastructure? So, to be honest, until you get into sort of the World War One, World War Two period, the idea of an ocean-going monitor is kind of a an oxymoron because the monitors, as designed in the U.S. Navy, had to cope with operating in riverine, estuary, and coastal environments that require very shallow draft, and that kind of mitigates against a ship of the size and a freeboard that's necessary to safely cross the oceans. Now, fair enough, a number of US monitors did manage to do so, but one, the ones that did manage to do so generally were later era monitors that had revised designs, and second, as you can see here with uh, Monon Doc, I think it is, um, even the revised designs had uh, a few issues trying to get through the oceans. <laughs> that is not the world's highest freeboard by a long shot, and you can see pretty much most of the main deck is awash in even relatively minor seas. So, bearing in mind those operational constraints and, as you say, the Union's infrastructure at the time, what I would probably have advised is actually something very similar to this particular um, post-American Civil War era monitor, you need that superstructure um, both for seakeeping and for keeping your crew dry and just having the necessary supplies and everything. The main change that I would make would be the installation of the kind of pop-up panels that you see in a lot of European breastwork monitors at the time, and those panels would be probably five, a good five, six foot, and the idea of those panels in the European monitors was specifically to artificially increase the apparent freeboard, which made travelling through the oceans much easier. Now, you can see in this particular design case, the turret has been elevated anyway, so the turret could still engage over them if push came to shove, although you probably wouldn't want to do that, um, if at all possible. But by having a sort of this sort of six-foot panel that you could push up and along the entirety of the ship, obviously in segments, then you go from having a four to five foot freeboard to having maybe a 10, 11 foot freeboard. Now, OK, that's still pretty low um, and you're still going to have a lot of issues crossing during storm periods. But in seas like 
this as pictured here, it's going to be a lot drier and it's going to be a lot more um, kind to the ship's structure rather than being constantly half swamped. So yeah, that, that would be my design. And if I'm not allowed to build this kind of central superstructure, which fair enough in the very close riverine environments is probably not a good idea unless you're it's literally just like a mess hall or something. You don't mind it being full of holes um, thanks to shot. Then at least the, the pop-up kind of breastwork monitor style panels just to increase that freeboard. And yeah, tall funnels, better engines. Dernwine asks a bit more of a personal question. He says, what parts of medieval history do you reenact? Do you restrict yourself to one time and one group, or do you branch out? And if so, do you have favourites? And yes, I'm reusing this photo for this question because I can. <laughs> I like this photo. Anyway, um, so the period, main period I do is late 14th century. I have a few different personas that I take up. This persona in, well, this particular armour, as I'm sure the purists amongst you will have noticed, is slightly too late for late 14th century. This is kind of 1420s-ish armour. Um, but this armour is on display elsewhere, which I'll come to in a minute now. And a slightly earlier form of armour is on its way, hopefully soon. Um, I, I have a few different sets of armour. So effectively, the personas I portray are two of my distant ancestors, one from the mid to late 14th century and then his grandson from the late 14th, early 15th century, um, the earlier of which was a knight of relatively small means, um, just about me making the income requirements for that period. And yes, there was actually a minimum income requirement for being a knight. His grandson, um, not so much. He was just a humble archer. So when I'm portraying the the older one, then he I'm the knight. If but if necessary, if requirements are uh, in place for the particular event that we're doing, then I will portray his grandson, who, as I say, is a longbow archer. And so I've taught myself how to shoot heavy uh, longbows. Nowhere near as good as some of the experts out there who can pull 150, 160 plus pound longbows, but I can do 120 to 130 pounds with relatively decent consistency. So that's two. Um, uh, I also do have a set of male armour, consistent and shield, etc., all consistent with portraying Sir William Marshall. So obviously that's a uh, hundred plus years earlier than uh, than the uh, latter part of the 14th century so that's fun to do um although that doesn't tend to see the light of day all that all that commonly i tend to actually keep the the helmet and mail around in the 14th century ex uh, displays to show people what older forms of armor protection looked like um and then the other character that I portray is a early 14th century Hungarian noble um, because I'm lucky enough to have been granted permission to use the uh, the Caroly colors and coat of arms and so I'm in the process of finalizing my armor shield etc weapons to portray a as I say, an early 14th century Hungarian nobleman at war, which is quite interesting because at that period, the armour in use there is, in certain areas, slightly different to the armour used in the majority of Western Europe. So that's all fun and games. And yes, when the, when the new armour set arrives, I will inevitably obviously have to show you what it looks like. And I can even use it to talk to you about some of the characteristics of armor and armor technology because there's actually a surprising level of continuity in certain aspects of the metallurgy that goes into making good quality medieval armor plate armor that is uh, as there is that goes into late 19th early 20th century battleship armor and so that should be a fairly interesting video if a little bit rattly as far as groups go, I have cooperated with a number of different groups to help out at different events, but I generally uh, restrict myself to a one primary group, and that is the Paladins of Chivalry, based down in Croydon. Um, if you happen to have an interest in medieval reenactment, medieval history, and are based in the sort of south of England, 
especially southeast England, that kind of area, uh, then do have a look around the website-facebook page, see if you want to join up. We can always use new members. And hey, you might even get to hit me with a sword at some point. And now on to the Patreon question segment. Coos Army 001 asks, suppose this might be a more modern question than you usually get, but it but are there many instances in history where ships are not given a name, perhaps just a numerical designation? If so, did the crews tend to view this unfavourably, and did they tend to come up with unofficial names or have other ways of coping with the superstition? Also, did any of it appear to work? So there's a few instances, but they're not that common in the overall scheme of things. Sailors do like their names on their ships. It waffles a little bit back and forth with the Germans. In the First World War, um, a lot of the torpedo boats and destroyer-ish vessels are just known as G-39, V-25, etc. In the 20s and early 30s, it that changes, and torpedo boats and destroyers both start to get names. And then towards the end of the 30s, they revert back to calling them by numbers again. Um, in other instances with the Royal Navy, they started off with torpedo boats having names like HMS Lightning. Some of them were then reclassified as torpedo boat whatever. Um, things, very small things like motor torpedo boats, motor gun boats, e-boats, that coastal motor boats, those kinds of things, were obviously PT boats, would just be known as whatever designation followed by a number so it's kind of at that boundary of small surface com uh, combatants that are ocean going like uh, the large torpedo boats and small destroyers that you see a little bit of a back and forth now when it came to the really small stuff there might be an unofficial name amongst the crew but the crew's so small that really that that's kind of lost to us and it's known basically as like pt 109 or whatever when it comes to the sort of the, the ocean going torpedo boats i.e. the actual ships as opposed to boats and the destroyers apparently moving back to numbers as opposed to names was actually a very unpopular move in the kriegsmarine amongst the rank and file crew and on those ships, obviously, they're around for longer. They've got larger numbers of crew on board. There were a fair number of unofficial names that were come up with, um, but it's relatively difficult to track them down because they're, because of their unofficial nature, they tend to be recorded in personal accounts of various surviving crew where that particular crewman actually feel, feels it's relevant. Um as far as whether or not it worked, <laughs> naming ships to bring them luck, mm, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it had seemed to have too much effect one way or the other, other than it, it does appear a little bit less personal in a way when you read about ships that are just designated by numbers being lost, as opposed to when you read about a ship by a name that has been lost, that tends to have a little bit more of an effect but that's kind of the anthropomorphization that leads to them having names in the first place. Timo Fiebich asks, How effective were anti-aircraft cruisers during World War II, especially in the early time of the war, when anti-aircraft was not as effective as it was later on? Also, I've only really heard of anti-aircraft cruisers on the Allied side and was wondering if the Axis side also deployed some and if there was a significant variation in effectiveness between the two. So in terms of anti-aircraft cruisers on the Allied side, you're basically looking at three primary classes. You've got the Atlantas and their subvariants on the US side. You've got the Dido and its subvariants on the Allied side, on the UK side, I should say. And you've also got conversions of the C-class cruisers on the Royal Navy side. And there's a few others here and there, but those are the. If you talk about anti aircraft cruisers in World War II, those, it's usually one of the, those three. In terms of the Axis, no, there, there, well, there wasn't, certainly wasn't anything like a dedicated anti aircraft cruiser for the Germans or Italians, or indeed for the Japanese. They were bringing in a dedicated anti aircraft destroyer towards the uh, start of the Second World War for them, but the outbreak of war 
put a halt on mass producing them like they wanted to. And to be fair, the anti-aircraft cruiser really is something that only the biggest of navies can come up with because smaller navies, they need the every cruiser hull they have to be able to fight in a surface action as well. Whereas an anti-aircraft cruiser, whilst they're very effective usually against destroyers, um, as was exemplified a number of times by both the Atlanta class and the Dido class, and whilst you can, if they've got long barrel weaponry, kind of be pressed into service for surface actions, as a number of the Dido class were in the Mediterranean, as the Atlanta itself kind of evidenced, they really don't do well when they're forced into kind of a conventional close range surface action. And so you can't really count them in your surface action elements um, for fleet battles and fleet engagements. And this is why only only fleets with fairly large number of cruisers can afford to build them, because they're not going to miss the odd class here and there when you have several dozen others to throw at the problem, whereas if you only have a dozen cruisers, you can't afford three or four of them to be anti-aircraft units because that's a significant percentage of your overall total. Warren Jervy asks, What were the most effective ranges of shipborne torpedoes in World War II Japanese and US navies, and how did this shape doctrine of use of torpedoes versus gunfire of the ships that carried such torpedoes? So, most torpedoes in World War II, as, and this applies as much on the Japanese and US sides as anywhere else, had ranges that varied depending on the platforms they were mounted on, and also on the setting you had them on. So in order of range from shortest to longest were airdropped torpedoes, the shortest ranged weapons, then submarine launched torpedoes, and then finally surface launched torpedoes, which would have the greatest range. And then beyond that, you also, as I said, had different settings. So you could have a slow speed setting that would run further, but obviously slower, and a high speed setting that would get to its destination a lot quicker, but it would run out of fuel a lot sooner. In terms of the shipborne torpedoes that we're talking about, the US one at fast settings, six, seven thousand yards, maybe just over ten thousand at slow. We're talking mainly about the Mark 15 in its various iterations. Now the Long Lance had a significantly longer travel distance. It could go over 20,000 yards in certain circumstances. And yeah, that did shape doctrine. I mean, one of there were many reasons for the US removing torpedoes from torpedo launchers from their cruisers, but one of them connected to the fact they didn't want them to be exploding was that the it was felt that the torpedo couldn't reach as far as the cruiser's guns and therefore it would be dead weight in a gun battle until the range closed, and of course during that time there would be a good chance of it being hit. Conversely, the fact that the Long Lance and some of its uh, immediate predecessors had rather longer ranges also contributed to the Japanese idea, amongst again, amongst other factors, as to why to retain them on their ships, because there were similar concerns, but obviously if you can shoot your torpedo as far or even further perhaps than your your cruisers can sustain accurate steady gunfire then they are a viable weapon at all ranges and that was a big surprise to uh, the allies and obviously the us in particular since they did a lot of fighting in the pacific um with destroyers again it affects the doctrine and tactics because for a Japanese destroyer, its torpedo armament can generally go a lot further than its guns can. So this is why you see them being so heavily weighted towards torpedoes on most of them, because they're the things that it can strike at far, the furthest away with. Um, it means that a destroyer can strike a cruiser without having to get into point-blank range effectively. It means that they can strike enemy destroyers without having to risk counter-battery fire from enemy destroyers. Whereas for the US, if you're in torpedo range, you're already well inside gun range. So that affects the decisions as well. So with a, if you were to um, invert the ships, but not the necessarily the crews, at something like the Battle of Samar, then you'd end up 
with something like, say, with the Johnston, it wouldn't have to close into gunfire range to unleash its torpedoes and then turn back. It would be able to volley off a whole wave of torpedoes at considerably longer range, where it's at considerably less risk, and then wait to see what happens with those torpedoes before then going after presumably anything that's still alive. Um, whereas the Japanese, I think, would have been a lot more reticent about certain actions if they knew they were going to have to get stuck in with gunfire before being able to set, to easily launch the torpedoes. Matthew Jones asks, I've read that between the world wars, Britain purchased some quantity of armour steel from Czechoslovakia. Please could you elaborate on why the Czechs had such an armour steel industry for what doesn't seem to be a major naval power and what Royal Navy ships this was used on? So at the time, in the late 1930s, Czechoslovakia actually had a surprisingly large armaments industry that it and it was supplying all sorts of things to all sorts of nations at the um, and, well, when the Germans invaded, they took over a lot of that, and there's a good reason why in the early part of the war there were things like the Panzer 38T in German um, arsenals. Part of this was the ability to manufacture armour steel, and in the late 1930s the British had something of a problem in that they were trying to enlarge the Royal Navy very, very quickly, but there were certain bottlenecks on production. They didn't have a shortage of steel, and I had plenty of that, where the bottlenecks were was in turning that steel into armour-grade steel. And if this had been the build-up of the 1900s and 1910s, it would have been a problem, but in between that period, a lot of the specialist infrastructure and industry that built this stuff had either decreased in size or gone out of business entirely. And... Whilst some of the physical space and capacity and expertise was still there, the government faced something of a problem. One was that to get the amount of armour steel that they wanted, they would have to pay for radical expansions or, well, resizing back up to the original size of a lot of the British manufacturers. And B, they knew that the big surge in building would die off in a few years, so they'd end up paying for... A lot of significant infrastructure that would just shut down and then be sold off again cheaply four or five years down the line. So this limited, this slightly limited bottleneck of production meant that they needed armour, they needed it now, they'd rather not pay over the odds for it because of the needed expansion they'd need to get from British manufacturers at that speed. And the checks were pretty good with their quality control and manufacturing process and you've also got to remember that armor steel comes in different sizes so for face hardened 14 15 inch thick armor plates for a king george V class battleship the limited amount of high-end armor manufacturing capacity in britain was much better placed as far as the government was concerned in dealing with that manufacturing those items whereas three four inch homogenous steel plates for the armor for say some of the carriers like illustrious here um, and some of the cruisers where face hardened plate either wasn't needed or very uh, limited amounts of were needed that stuff they thought well it's bulk it's relatively easy to make and we can outsource this and they did this went to uh, the checks as far as the ships it was used on, because of varying uh, issues, including delay in supply and the fact that, well, um, Germany ended up taking over significant parts of and then the entirety of uh, Czechoslovakia, they didn't get anywhere near as much as they'd actually ordered. But as I said, some of the carriers, illustrious here, um, did get um, elements of Czech armour plate put into her and a few bits and pieces did apparently wind up in a few cruisers here and there. Um, so they, there was about 10, 12,000 tonnes ordered, but not, as I say, not all of it got over to the UK. Joshua Pasquale asks, What would happen in the Age of Sail to the materials that made up ships when they were broken up? I know in some cases certain parts of ships would be recycled, where the figurehead was reused and such, but what about all the other ships? Were they recycled or just thrown away to rot? So it depended on the prestige of the ship that was being broken up and also why it was being broken up. A uh, particularly prestigious ship, um, especially when it was a ship that might have been captured from the enemy, 
would generally have the, the good parts taken out and reused, either in constructing a replica with which to troll your enemies, um, which both the US did with USS Macedonian in its various iterations and the British did with HMS President in its various iterations, or they would be, if it's just a, a particularly uh, well-respected ship at the time, it would be sent off to become things like roof beams and furniture in various establishments that uh, wanted the privilege. That's where, for example, the renowned desk comes from. Um, quite a number of pubs in England and uh, the rest of the UK are held up in part by significant chunks of former warship. And then for the rest of it, as I say, it depends why the ship's being broken up. If the ship's basically rotted out and is is going to fall apart anyway it, the remaining wood would just be chucked would be burned or used for various other waste purposes if the ship was being broken up because let's say it had been shot up in battle and it was far too badly damaged to be economically repaired but what was left of it was mostly sound then various bits would be broken up and reused. So if there was, say, an intact mast, that mast might go and be reused in a new ship. Um, something like the keel, long, large bits of wood were very rare, so something like the keel would be reused if it was entirely possible. And, yeah, so the vital, rarer parts of the, the vessel would be um, repurposed to other warships if possible, and then the lesser sections hull planking depth planking that kind of stuff would usually be either again reused if possible or sold off for other purposes construction flooring that kind of stuff the, the royal navy was very determined to get as much as possible out of the breaking up of its ships um, as much as it was out of building them and using them in service you could also find good quality parts being reused in a number of other purposes so semaphore towers and lighthouses needed at the time sort of flagpoles and masts a signal from and so quite a lot of ex-navy masts or, or parts of masts would find themselves on those buildings and uh, you'd even find a few in various civic buildings as well for flag purposes and such John McCarthy asks, During World War I, it seems that ships were thought to be old when they hit 10 years. Nowadays, though, ships serve far longer than that. For example, USS Nimitz was launched in 72, 48 years ago. What factors explain the difference beyond the slower pace of naval technological change, if indeed there are any? So, without drifting too much into post-1950s naval technology effectively it, most of it is naval technological change but part of it is also what form that technological change takes so in world war one for example power plants were getting progressively more and more efficient and more and more powerful so speed was going up armor was getting a lot thicker guns were getting a lot larger etc so all of these were fundamental parts of the ship's structure and one when they got bigger and better the old hull simply wasn't capable of supporting it i mean with the best will in the world if you take hms dreadnought and then look at her 10 15 years down the line you can't replace her twin 12 inch guns with anything much heavier there simply isn't the room and you'd basically be rebuilding the entire ship to do so, even if you could somehow squeeze maybe a twin 13.5 inch. But And you're definitely not going to do that on the wings, maybe on the centre line, but what would be the point? Um, armour is just massive and adds more weight, which slows the ship down. Even if you manage to balance it out with modern machinery, you're still ending up with a very small, relatively ineffective combatant compared to what you're now building. Look at Dreadnought's displacement versus, say, the displacement of something like a, a G3 or an N3 or a South Dakota that were being planned in the 1920s. And so the whole weapon system is effectively obsolete. And that translates through most of the ships. They're not quick enough. They're not heavily armed enough. They're not heavily protected enough. 
And to change all of those things, you'd be stripping the ship down so far and so much you effectively pay as much as you would for a brand new ship and you end up with something that is physically still smaller anyway. So it's these, these large macro scale technological changes. Once you get into World War II, it's a little bit more subtle because some of those changes are still involving weight and stability concerns, but on a much lesser scale than kind of caliber of naval armament. And okay, fair enough, part of that is enforced due to the naval treaties holding everything back for a while. But you can look at something like, say, of using the UK as an example, an R-class battleship, um, let's say Ramillies, versus something like Queen Elizabeth or Valiant. Now, they're, they're similar ships, they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. But when you look at what they managed to get out of, say, Queen Elizabeth with modern updated engines, and they didn't have to change the armour, didn't have to change the guns, but they could change things like the shells, the elevation, the charges, the fire control systems, adding radar, and so and switching out the secondary battery for dual purpose. And so Queen Elizabeth, despite being the older vessel, was far more effective a combatant by the start of World War II than Ramillies was. And you can see the sort of similar things with some of the US standards that were rebuilt. There were still limitations, mostly around speed, but they became far more effective combatants without having to shift the uh, main turrets and change those, or and the main guns, and without having to update the ship's armour. So it's becoming much more of a systems-based thing. Once you go forward, especially for things like aircraft carriers, again, it's a case of the technology that is updating and the technological change in naval in naval terms, although it's slowed down a little bit from compared to the pre-World War One's arms race, it's not stood still by any means. Um, but a lot of these changes, I say, are now more systemic than macro. So if you've got a destroyer that can fire missiles, you've got, and it's like, it's like, I don't know, again, this is vague because not my area of speciality, but let's say you've got an SM-1 missile. If you have a VLS missile system that can fire an SM-1 missile, then you can fire an SM-2, an SM-3, an SM-6. The missiles improve, but the launching system doesn't have to do that much. Um, with a carrier, you could be flying an A-6, you could be flying an F-4, you could be flying an F-8, you could be flying an FA-18, you could be flying an F-35. The carrier doesn't change, it's just storing different aircraft, and similarly the weapons on the aircraft. Um, and the same thing with radar, if you're changing the radar, you pull the old one off, you put the new one on, as long as you've got power running to it, then your new radar will work better. If that needs better display equipment, better computers, you can pull those in and out without affecting a macro scale change on the overall hull of the vessel. And so these days, as opposed to the ship being an integrated weapon system in and of itself, the way that a battleship might be, these days I think most modern warships in large part, they're more like steel wrappers for a bunch of weapons and systems that can be much more easily to a certain degree, pulled in and out of of various vessels. And you can have things added on as well. So, yeah, I think that that's why hulls these days tend to last a little bit longer. When you get a brand new technology that require, that just won't fit into the slots that it already exist, then that's when you end up having to see new classes. Um, so, for example, say with like the Royal Navy's Type 42s, once you are designing uh, sea vipers with multiple VLS cells, there's not really the space on a Type 42 or the design to do that, so you have to end up with a Type 45. It's a new hull, new ship, etc. Um, but then when you compare the capabilities of something like, say, an FFG-7 or a Type 23 at the times of them going out of service compared to their capabilities when they started, you'll see practically every system within them has been changed and the hull is you, hull and sometimes the engines are usually the only bits that are left and would have been recognizable to the person who was aboard the first time that they were went into the water <laughs>
And so that brings us to the end of episode 103. Thank you very much for listening. Just one bit of channel admin for this week. Some of you will have noticed that in the Battle of Jutland video, I've been using a series of miniatures to display some of the fleet movements. Um, yeah, the 250 odd tiny 1 to 6,000 scale miniatures. And then, yeah, having to reposition every single ship in the fleet on both sides. It takes a while to generate those, but it's fun. Um, some people have offered some feedback to try and make them more visually distinctive from each other, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, but in in broader terms, assuming that there was uh, some system in place to make it a little bit more obvious who whose side each particular ship model was on, do you think that the idea as a whole works at all? Um, if so, or if not, please uh, let us know in the comments below, because that will inform how some future uh, battle videos are done. Now, obviously, with Jutland, you have to go to 1 to 6,000 scale, because, well, I'd say, with 250 ships, one, uh, um, at larger scale, they're, they're just not going to end up being painted. There's far too many of them, but also, two, just the sheer scope of the battle and the size of the fleets means that you'd need a sort of a football pitch if you were going to do it at any larger scale but for smaller battles like say midway coral sea um dogger bank for the various conflicts in the mediterranean etc i could get my hands on some slightly larger scale and therefore easier to differentiate models um to sort of conduct reenactments if you like instead of uh, giving you the spaghetti on LSD charts that tend to be the, the tracking charts of these kinds of battles. But I want to get your feedback first on whether you think that's a good idea, whether you'd appreciate the, the, the that way of displaying the battles uh, so that I don't end up with a house full of <laughs> various era fleets at different scales and not really have any further use for them. So yeah, just let me know that. And uh, thanks for listening.